Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Uh, my name is Ryan Groves. I work at the Seaver College Career Center, and this is the Seaver Speaker Series. It is a conversation that we're having with our community to help us all answer the question of what do we do with the time that's been given to us? Now, this question is extra special because these are very extraordinary times. Um, yes, we are in a crisis. We are all beset by all sorts of challenges, but there's also great opportunity within that. And uh, we believe that our community is a way to unlock that community, uh, that, that opportunity that comes from those challenges. So to help us do that, we've invited some remarkable people, alumni, to come and share their stories and demystify the process of how they got to where, uh, to where they are, how they achieve success, and what we might be able to take home and do ourselves. So like I said, uh, this is a conversation. Um, uh, Stefan Holt has joined us today. He is a fantastic alumnus uh, who you know, works at NBC in New York City. And he is in a very fast paced um, industry and constant change that demands excellence of him. And he, he reaches and achieves those heights um, every single day. And he does so because of the connections, the experience, the education he received. And he'll be sharing more of that story with us. But as we go, be thinking of questions that you want to ask. Uh, as this is a conversation, this needs to be a two-way street. So if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and you can either send that to me, you can send it to Chad, or you can send it to Molly. Chad and Molly are my wonderful co-host today and they'll, they'll be helping us out. Uh, so if I may, it's, it's my incredible pleasure today to introduce to you uh, Stefan Holt. Um, Stefan Holt is, uh, uh, is in broadcast media. He's a news anchor and a journalist and he is somebody who has no uh no shortage of experience when it comes to diving face first into the fires of life <laughs> and seeing the the challenges as an opportunity to tell a story and to connect people and to find value there uh so uh, uh stefan you are in new york city he is he has a wife he has two kids um he's an alum he's he's on the other coast and we'll forgive him to that because <laughs> that because we know he's going to come back. Uh, I'll let you uh, tell a little bit of your story um, now about how you started um, and how you got to where you are and what we can all learn from that. So, so please take it away. I still believe in West Coast, Best Coast, by the way. Let's just get that clear <laughs> off the great. No, thank you. <laughs> off the bat. No, I, I love it here in New York, too. It's great to be on the East Coast. I, I'm bi-coastal. But uh, no, thank you so much, Ryan. It's good to be here and, and good to be uh, with my friends from Pepperdine. I see a lot of familiar faces here in the room. So glad you're listening uh, and joining us today. Um, so yeah, a little bit uh, kind of background. You know, as a journalist, we do the who, what, when, where, and why. So who am I? Uh, my name is Stefan Holt. I was Seaver class of 2009. Uh, studied uh, broadcast journalism and political science. I was with Newswaves. Uh, I was a SIGAP. I was on the debate team for a short time. I was a public safety uh, officer, I guess. I was in the guard shack waving to people who came in on campus. I worked in the Washington, D.C. program for, for a while there, too. So was super connected at Pepperdine, did a lot. Um, I miss Pepperdine terribly. I, yes, I miss the weather. Um, I miss the view, but I certainly miss the people and my that sense of family and, and all the connections that I've made throughout the years and during my time there. And another interesting connection about Pepperdine, um, my girlfriend, sophomore year, ended up becoming my wife. So yes, I am uh, part of the Pepperdine Sweetheart Club. And I even got married at Pepperdine in Stouffer Chapel. So um, very special, special place to us. Uh, some more background. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. I moved to New York when I was 13 uh, for, for middle school and then for high school. And then I came out to California uh, after I was in New York. So yes, bi-coastal and Midwest all at the same time. Um, so that's the who. The what do I do? I anchor the 4 p.m. and the 11 p.m. newscast at WNBC TV in New York. Uh, it's the flagship NBC owned and operated station. We're based out of 30 Rockefeller Plaza. Uh, I would be at 30 Rock right now speaking to you, but um, through kind of a crazy day, I ended up having to do a live shot in Stamford, Connecticut this evening. And I was worried I wasn't going to make it back to the office in time for this because I really wanted to join you. So I came home uh, because it's right in between. And you're here live in my fancy home studio that I've been broadcasting from uh, every couple of weeks. Um, just TV behind me. I've got a camera set up over here and 
trying to make do during this coronavirus uh, to work from home and be safe. Um, so I work late nights. My day starts usually around 2 p.m. and the day around 11.45. We do the 11 o'clock news. Uh, I do some reporting as well, as I mentioned, I was in Sanford, Connecticut today. I do a lot of breaking news, political news lately, a lot of pandemic news. Um, my hobbies and passions, I really love aviation and flying, so I do a lot of aviation reporting as well. I earned my pilot's license in 2006 here in New York, so I do a lot of flying on the side. I've done those kinds of stories. I've had stories take me across the tri-state region here in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, even some reporting in Washington, D.C. I was recently down there for the State of the Union address. And then I've also reported from Havana, Cuba, um, when Fidel Castro died. So I've been all over the world with this job. Uh, so I already told you the where I am. I'm here in my house. Um, and part of the, the crazy thing of all this being in New York is that we're still really in the throes of this coronavirus crisis. Um, it's not even just a hot spot. It's really the epicenter here in New York. And, and it's certainly bad on the West Coast in California as well and in other parts of the, of the country. But just New York uh, and this region, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, is um, just really paralyzed by this. Uh, paralyzed from an economic sense, paralyzed by fear. I think there's a lot of emotions that have come with this. Um, so part of covering this, I've had to split my time between working here at home working in the field and then working from the newsroom and from the office. Um, I know it's been different state to state, so I figure I'd just kind of give you a little bit of the context of what we're dealing with here in our area. I mean, New York City alone, and these numbers, unfortunately, are probably off because I wrote them down last night, um, so they've grown again. But um, nearly 16,000 people have died in New York City just alone. And if you put that next to the number of lives lost at the World Trade Center 9-11, that was 2,600 people. Um, you can see this is just a staggering loss of life in New York City. 28,000 people have died in New York State. Um, 10,000 people have died in New Jersey. 3,500 people have died in Connecticut, where I was just reporting from today because the state is finally reopening. Um, I never thought it would be front page news seeing people eating at an outdoor cafe, eating lunch, sipping beverages. Um, that was our lead story today because they're finally starting to reopen. It was a sign of hope, a sign of life returning, but still a sign of uncertainty because we don't know if we will start to see cases rise again. Fortunately, they've declined enough that they can start to reopen some businesses, but uh, who knows what the future is going to bring. Um, so we are seeing some signs of hope. We are starting to see the beaches open for Memorial Day. Uh, they're talking about maybe some things opening up here in New York in the city starting later this month or maybe July. But all this is to say, I really think this is an extraordinary time to be a journalist in New York, in this region where our reporting has so much impact and we're doing work every day, hard work to keep our viewers informed. We're also trying to keep them hopeful and keep them inspired uh, by seeing their fellow New Yorkers and what they're capable of, those frontline heroes those essential workers that are, are keeping things running and, and saving lives at the end of the day. Put that in the context, I was here in New York City on 9-11. Uh, I was in high school. I remember the day like it was yesterday. I was in biology class. I heard the first plane fly over our school, heard the first crash. I saw the collapse of the North Tower. What's interesting, the parallels between that event and this current crisis, if you think about 9-11, it was really a shock of terror in one single day. And then this long aftermath beyond that in the days, weeks, and years after, it was a, the difference between that and this crisis. You are seeing New Yorkers coming together, but this is painfully slow. It's every day we learn about the loss of life. We learn about the individuals that are dealing with this. And it's just unfolding very slowly and painfully. Um, but at the same time, there's nothing better than seeing these moments of courage, these frontline workers, or every day we have hospital. Um, um, hospital discharges, you know, a hospital will discharge its 500th coronavirus patients or its, you know, 600th. And, and every day you see those workers standing outside the hospital applauding and celebrating. It's a celebration of life. Or, or you see people donating PPE or donating food or donating their time, these acts of generosity. It's great to see these moments of inspiration and hope. Um, I don't know if the 7 p.m. cheer is big where you guys are, but here it's amazing to hear the applause, people banging on pots and pans, 
and just celebrating our frontline workers and our heroes. So um, that's a little bit of background of what's going on here. How did I get here to New York? Um, that's a great question. I arrived in New York in March of 2016. So it's been four years working at WNBC. Uh, before that, I was working at WMAQ-TV in Chicago, which is the NBC-owned station there. I did the morning show, anchored the morning show for about five years. I was also a weekday morning reporter and a weekend reporter uh, anchor when I was there. And I covered several stories there, the Chicago teacher strike, uh, the corruption sentencing of Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich, who was recently, um, uh, his sentence was commuted by uh, President Trump. And uh, the Blackhawks, their Stanley Cup victories in uh, 2013 and 2015, also covered the soaring gun violence in Chicago. And, uh, and even the shooting death of, of an unarmed teenager, Laquan McDonald, uh, the murder of Laquan McDonald, uh, which went on to win a Peabody Award for, for our station. So very proud of that. Before I was in Chicago, I was in West Palm Beach at the ABC, uh, ABC station zoned by Hearst Television. Um, but I spent two years there as a morning reporter and a weekend morning anchor. So I've kind of bounced around that. And uh, before that, I was at Pepperdine. I was at Newswaves 26, uh, where I did a lot there. I was an anchor, reporter, weatherman, floor director, camera operator, writer. Um, I think if Dr. Murray had asked me to scrub the toilets and clean the bathrooms, I would have done that as well. I did a little bit of everything. <laughs> so it was a great experience. And, and I had some wonderful professors, some wonderful colleagues, some great mentors. Um, you know, some that popped to mind are Dr. Teresa De Los Santos. Uh, who's still there at Pepperdine teaching, Adam Housley, who's at Fox News, he's a Pepperdine alum who came back to help us out, and then Ted Garcia, who is one of uh, my instructors, but a, a Pepperdine alum who's now working in San Diego in radio. So just had some great opportunities being in that news waves environment. Uh, funny enough, real quickly, I did not come to Pepperdine to study broadcast journalism, and I saw Dr. Caldwell's here, so he'd be happy to know. I actually came to Pepperdine to study political science. That was my, my goal. I had my sights set on public service, and that's why I came to Pepperdine. Um, but it was funny. I was in my dorm. It was in Pengilly Hall freshman year, just flipping through TV channels uh, on the in-house TV, and I came across this newscast, and there were students reading the news which I thought was intriguing. It was really interesting. And there was one student that I recognized who was in my speech class. And so, uh, you know, he's reading the news. And I, I saw him in class a couple of days later. I was like, how do you get to do that? You know, what, what is this newscast you're doing? And he said, you have to audition and you have to be a communications major. And I thought, well, how hard can that be to be a communications major? Um, yeah. <laughs> Foolish, right? Um, spring, I added broadcast journalism to my already heavy course load and all the other things that I was doing and, um, and started taking journalism classes. And I loved it. And I, and I love political science as well. I mean, I, I still love international relations and I love talking about Congress and state government as well. And, and I learned a lot in that sense. And that's really helped in my progression as a journalist to know about how our systems of government work and, and the, the philosophies that go into that. So I, I'll mention one more thing and then I'll try to button it up um, because Pepperdine played a huge role in what I call my big break and how I really got involved into television. And that was in 2007, my sophomore year. Um, I didn't travel overseas sophomore year like a lot of students do. Um, I actually was on campus. I was a SIGAP. I was working um, public safety at the that time too. And um, a brother from SIGEP who was out of state was looking for looking for broadcast majors to be part of this new online company that started in 2006. It was called palestra.com at the time. And they would cover college sports, college soccer, college basketball, football, if, if you had the program there. Uh, they were based in Ohio, but they needed reporters for campuses all across the country. So they had a USC reporter and they had a Georgetown reporter and a Columbia University reporter. They wanted me to be their Pepperdine reporter and cover sports um, at Pepperdine. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. They gave me a tripod, a camera, a microphone, and they paid me 50 bucks a month, I think, something like that to cover on-campus events. So I was like, hey, a little bit of cash on the side. It's nice. Um, but uh, I said somewhere, it was actually junior year 2007. I was living in Lovernick, woke up one morning to someone pounding on the door of our dorm room. And it was a public safety officer. And he said, you guys have to put some clothes on, get out of your dorm. There is a fire. I'm like, okay. And then he left because he had to go knock on a bunch of doors. So we're all groggy, like, what's going on? It's like five in the morning. 
and walk out of Lovernick and, and right in the parking lot there next to the, the, the building, the hills surrounding Pepperdine were engulfed in orange flames, smoke flying into the air. You could see ash starting to fall. It's like nothing I'd ever seen. It was totally apocalyptic, almost something out of a film and I couldn't believe it. Um, so as students were starting to evacuate, what does a journalism major do? But he runs back inside his dorm and grabs a camera and says, uh, let's capture this. And um, it sounds foolish when I talk about it now and, and potentially dangerous, but um, I started rolling on video of this fire and the helicopters swooping in. And then that turned into interviews with students and, and getting all this footage. And I was like, well, what do I do with this footage? Um, so I called the producer who's at the Palestra in Ohio and I said, hey, we're evacuating the campus. We've got this wildfire. Do you think you guys want this? He's like, yeah, 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 send it in, you know, email it. So I started sending all this video and they were posting on their website. And then my phone was blowing up from Fox News Channel because little did I know that palestra.com, this internet startup had just signed a content sharing agreement with Fox News Channel um, literally that same week as the fire. So a producer from New York called and said, yeah, yeah, send some more video. We can't get our camera crews close enough because Pacific Coast Highway is closed down. Malibu Canyon's closed down. You're right there. So, um, you know, sending B-roll and sound bites turned into full-fledged interviews and reports and packages. And then they said, just stand in front of the camera, do a, do a stand-up. And, um, you know, next thing I know, my stuff was on Studio B with Shepard Smith. And it was, um, it was literally trial by fire. So, um, and I loved it. It was, I was super passionate about it. And I realized this is my calling. This is what I wanted to do. And, uh, and that kind of gave me the, the launching point to start my career, which went to Florida to Chicago and then here to New York. So that's a little bit of my progression. Um, any words of wisdom or advice of how I got here? Um, hard work, definitely essential. It's long hours. It's not nearly as glamorous as it looks on TV, especially being a family man now. I have two boys, you know, uh, Sam is turning one next month. Henry's almost three. Um, you know, you want to spend those moments with your family, but sometimes dad has to go and he's got to cover a story. So um, it, it's hard in that sense because you are really committed to this career and passionate about it. Um, you know, hard work is important. Smart work is important. I, my advice to people who want to get into this is do it. There's so many opportunities now. I mean, if you think about this phone has a camera on it and really broadcast quality audio, you can start shooting pieces on your own right now today and uploading them to YouTube or online. There's so many opportunities. Um, and if you want to be on air, apply for on air jobs. Um, you know, I, I think it's noble to, to do a lot of different things in the business, you know, work behind the assignment desk or work as a writer or as a producer. But if your goal is to be on air, you really need to be getting those reps on air and, and doing that sort of work. Um, and then one more element I'm going to mention, and just because it's really played a role in, in my progression, is just recognizing God's timing and a lot of things. It's so easy, especially when I was coming out of Pepperdine, to be eager, like, oh, I want to get to the, the major markets. I want to get to market one in New York. And um, as, as eager and as exciting as that is, and it's good to set those goals, God's timing works in a way sometimes that doesn't put that plan into immediate action. And, and I'm so thankful for those opportunities that I had in Florida, in Chicago, and even at Pepperdine that really equipped me for what I'm doing here uh, right now. So it, it's, it's because of those moments, it's because of that journey, and it's because of God's timing that you, know, you, you end up where you need to be. And, and I have in my heart the belief that this is something I'm called to do, and I will be here where I need to be, where God puts me um, when he needs me there. So just being cognizant and remembering that. So that's my spiel. That's what I have to say. I'd love to open it up, uh, Ryan, if you have more questions or anything you want to dial in, uh, in particular on, but I think that just kind of sets up a little bit of where we're going tonight. Yeah. And, and, and that's wonderful. Uh, so for, first things first, I can think of no better start to a career, um, in front of the camera than the Pepperdine entrance gateway booth. There's no place where you smile at more people more often and wave. Like it's right here. That's yeah. No. Incredible. That's, that's no. the training right there. That's the value of the education. <laughs> you too can be a public service, a public safety officer. Yeah. 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 Um, th th that's wonderful. So I, I love that start and uh, you, your story throughout has this, this thread 
that again, there's, there's a unique identity to, to Pepperdine. There is a unique value that we have as a community and we share and that we need to remind each other of and be constantly rediscovering. So when I listen to you, I see this thread of, yes, uh, competence and the work that goes into developing that uh, and the, the time and skill and effort it takes to be excellence, but also that met with character um, and that emotional depth and fortitude and vision um, and sense of, of sacrifice for the greater good that sets up something remarkable. Um, I mean, did, did you come from a place with wildfires? Like, where are you from again? Like your home state? New York and Chicago. No, d definitely no exactly. wildfires. <laughs> so, so no wildfires. See, I, I Lizards, come, but. Yes, opposite. <laughs> uh, but I come from Kansas where I, I'm used to people, if a tornado's coming, they go outside with a camera. But to have somebody from, from New York to there's a fire and to have the wherewithal to say there, there's something of value here that will require sacrifice on my part. Um, how do you think that you developed that character um, and continue to grow that in, in your work today, especially as you're constantly faced with, yes, good news, but also challenging news and things like COVID? How do you balance um, that constant need to rise to the challenge before you? You know, it, it, sacrifice is an interesting thing because it's, um, I think there's, you look at how much we honor and revere sacrifice in our culture here in the United States. And we have Memorial Day coming up. We, we honor the sacrifice of our veterans. We honor the, the sacrifice of, of people that have put, the, put others before themselves. So I, I think it's an honorable calling and it, it's something that's ingrained within our culture and our society and certainly within our, our, our national uh, ideology or our, our national ideal. Um, you know, so I, I, I'd have to say that I've, I'm certainly inspired by that. I'm inspired by the people that I've seen go before me, especially in this calling of journalism. Just a quick sidebar, on the third floor of 30 Rockefeller Plaza, when you step off the elevators, there's a memorial right there. So every day when I'm walking to my studio, I pass by this memorial and inside um, there are pictures, there, there are artifacts. Um, there's a, a flak jacket that was worn by David Bloom, who was a correspondent who, who died in Iraq during the invasion um, of, of a pulmonary embolism. Um, there's a, a picture of, of the North Tower of the World Trade Center where a broadcast engineer from WNBC died on 9-11. On uh, that memorial is a way to recognize the sacrifices of those news employees that went before us, that answered the call of breaking news and sadly um, did not come out of that situation alive. Um, so we, we remember that, we reflect on that every single day. And um, you know, I, I, I just hope that w w the folks that are watching at home, the folks that are watching this tonight realize that behind the makeup and the camera and the lights and all of this, that these are human beings that are having to sacrifice time with their families or, or sometimes sacrifice their lives to deliver this news. And I think the reason we do that is because it is so vitally important to our democracy. It's so vitally important that we have a free press. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not getting choked up here. I just have a little bit of cold. But um, you know, I, I, just, I, I really believe it is important, especially in a time like this COVID crisis, that information flows to the people and that the decision makers are held to account as well. Um, I don't know who said this, but you know, our, our, our goal as journalists is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And, and I think this is a, a perfect example during this crisis and so many times in our history that um, our job as journalists is to ask the tough questions and to try and get answers for the people who rely on us. Well, and, th and that's actually fascinating because you said you started with political science, right? Yes. And so, yes, you're in journalism, but you were very much in a political social career. Uh, in a, yeah. a more, like, selfishly, I want to say, like, hey, yeah, liberal arts, like, that's what it's for. <laughs> um, like, we, we, we do this. Um, but, but still, there's, there, there's again, that, that other thread of your value in, in your job comes from that, that ability to synthesize, you know, in, intelligence and strategic wherewithal. Uh, with with that deep set like philosophy and belief of what's what's right and wrong so how how does that influence your day-to-day -day? like as as a broadcaster how do you balance um, your character in media 
You know, it's interesting, and I'll be honest, sometimes I, I don't even think about it. Um, it's easy to go through the day to day and realize that we have a lot of responsibilities to the day, and you tend to lose sight of the big picture. You get a little caught in the minutia of, okay, I've got a five o'clock hit, I've got to get this information in, I've got to call these people, I've got to figure out uh, how to put this story together and get on the air so that it's, you know, it, it passes our standards and that it informs our viewers and is something visually engaging that, that people want to watch. Um, it, it's sometimes hard to remember at the end of the day, um, that, that character aspect of, of am, am I representing the character that, that I want to be or, or the character that we are as, as journalists, I, I think as a collective community. Um, you know, the funny thing is it, it, it kind of backtracking a little bit, because you, you made, made me think about it, um, the sense that, look, I, I wasn't originally going to be a broadcast major. So yes, that, that public service aspect was there. You know, I think that there was always something in me, but it was really my experiences at Pepperdine and my experiences in life that kind of fostered this curiosity towards that direction. Um, and that just organically grew over time. But you know, I always have to bring it back to the people and the experiences that push me in that direction. I think anyone can relate to that, to, to the people and the experiences that, that certainly got them and going to a certain direction. I'm just thankful that I happened to be flipping through channels one day and saw news waves and, and was able to get involved with that. And that just kind of started this domino effect. Um, you know, and, and look, along the way, I, I think every experience, every story, every encounter with someone on a report uh, on a story I've put together has certainly changed me as a person. It's impacted my abilities and as a story to, as a storyteller, and it's impacted my my creative efforts, but also my empathy toward towards other people. And and that's the one thing that I try to remember each and every day out there is that um, you know we're talking to people sometimes on the happiest best day of their life, and a lot of cases on the worst day of their life. So um, you know we have to empathize with those people and, and be respectful. Yeah. So how how do you or how have you learned, I would say, to see people? Because I love what you're saying about being a storyteller. And throughout this conversation, you've consistently made heroes of people, um, whether it's Adam Housley or a professor yeah. or uh, you know, other students. Like Throughout this conversation, and again, being someone in media, you are an observer and a consumer of, of current events and culture and society, and then also an outlet for it. Uh, so, yeah, how, how do you learn to filter? How do you find, find the, the good and tell that story? How do you find those heroes um, in your life? I think a lot of it, at least um, talking about the heroes, when we do interviews, it's, it's let the people do, tell their story. Um, you know, that sometimes I, uh, my, the fa my favorite part of my job is just to sit back and listen to people and let them tell their story. I mean, I grew up hearing stories from my dad and from my grandparents and you know, my, I, I had a, a grandfather who uh, he was in the Vietnam War as, as a, in the Air Force and, you know, telling stories of that time. Um, you know, another grandfather worked in the aerospace industry and hearing his stories of working for Boeing during the space race and, and during the, the race for, for jet transports. And, you know, it's it's storytelling is it's as old as humanity itself. I mean, just look at the Bible. Uh, we, we love to tell stories. We love to hear stories. And, and as I said, the, the best part of my job is just getting to listen to people and then try to figure out the nuggets of those stories and how to underscore them or to highlight them or just to really make them shine in the context of our newscasts or in a news report. Um, some would call that, that filtering. And, and, and to a certain extent, yes, it, you know, I, I think my job is not, not necessarily to filter, but to facilitate, to try to enhance um, that story so that there is a connection to it. And I, I think there's an argument that sometimes just the raw story itself is good enough. Um, that's why I think you're seeing a lot of uh, media organizations are going towards just posting raw video on their websites. There's no narration. There's no splicing or editing. They'll just show the whole raw, unfiltered video right there. Uh, look at social media on Instagram. You know, we, we have uh, a lot of just raw video on there. So, um, you know, and, and there's something interesting about that as well. I think just kind of the visceral experience of being in the moment, raw, live, unfiltered, untouched. There's something 
interesting and stimulating and informative about that too. But I, I also love my job of just trying to take a story and really bring out the best elements of it and, and draw that connection to the viewers so that they are feeling an attachment to that person's story and maybe inspired by it, you know, inspired to take action, inspired to make a choice come election day in the voting booth, or, you know, make a choice during this pandemic of how to keep themselves and their families safe. Um, you know, I, I think that information is powerful and the more that I can do to facilitate that, I, I hope that helps me do my job better. Um, absolutely. And thank you, by the way, that's, that's beautiful. Thank uh, you. Well, especially right now. And be, because there is, there's so much information. Um, and with that comes a lot of uncertainty and that I think our whole culture has this, this hunger, this quest for authenticity and for truth and to be able to trust and communicate, um, and to belong to something. Um, and the antithesis of that is with all the confusion, there's also come a lot of fear and come a lot of mistrust. And like people who would say that uh, these services and these platforms aren't, aren't your friend, which uh, as you're saying is ironic because like it's, it's becoming in many ways where like the storytelling, the media, the news is sort of back in the hands and shared by the people. Um, so how, how do you balance this whole idea of of you know media and its job and culture and it being a part of a well-functioning society in these changing times. It's so important, and it's been an important element of our society uh, for for centuries now. Um, you know, and it, it, so so this era is, is no different in that sense. I think what is different now is the I think the the idea of news literacy, the idea of understanding sources of information, um, you know, named and unnamed sources. I, I think the sense of news literacy as well as we hear the word, and I hate saying this because we hear it all the time, fake news. Um, you know, that, that, that is, that is a, a term that's been thrown around a lot lately. And, and look, I respect that. Um, you know, there is the concept though of news literacy that I think if you were, as a news consumer, I sure hope that you're smart enough to know uh, I sure hope you're smart enough to know what's real and what's fake. And sometimes it is confusing and it can be misleading. And that's why going to multiple sources of information, really finding a news organization or a newspaper or a news outlet that you trust. And, um, you know, that that's so important. Um, there's, and, and I'm now hearing my, my communications professors uh, in the back of my mind talking about this whole you know, cognitive dissonance and echo chambers and things like that. Um, you know, th there's a lot of theory to it. But at the end of the day, I, I, I really respect our viewers and, and I want to be respectful of them and respectful of their time. Uh, and I want them to know that we are trying to inform them with the best of our abilities, with the best of our standards, so that we are being fair, that we are presenting information in a way that, um, you know, there is analysis to it, but that they can make decisions off of. And we're not saying something to be popular. We're not saying something to reinforce your state of mind, sometimes it's going to challenge your beliefs. It's going to challenge what you think you know. Um, yeah, I, I think that's okay. Um, you know, I, I think that challenge is good. And certainly it's a competitive environment in, in the media landscape. I mean, we're all trying to essentially do the same thing, but, um, you know, we just have to I think we have to put our faith in the, in the viewers and the readers that, you know, that they're, they're going to make smart decisions. I, I sure hope that's, that's the case. Um, and, and that's excellent. And I, I, I wish you could see all the private chats because uh -oh. I, I know we, I know we had told everybody to send us questions, but they're all sending in thank yous. Ah, um, <laughs> I'm looking at them now. Well, wow. okay. I, thank I, you. I want you to wow. know that's really special. Um, wow. that, that doesn't happen. Uh, and it, Again, I think that's the value of, of these relationships with this community is like, hey, we all, we all know you, you trusted you. You waved at us when we drove by the guardhouse. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, you're, you're part of the, the family, and, and we need to have those, those voices we trust. And there's tremendous value in that. Um, so I, as special as, as that is, in respect to everybody's time who's on here today, I do want to transition to something I hope will dovetail. And that's, uh, you're in this industry that is fast paced, that is constantly changing. You have a wife, you have kids, you um, have, have definitely you know, thoughts for the future. So how do 
you think through what's next? Like when you're looking at uh, the career landscape, so to speak, in your industry, um, how does that look? W where do you think we're going? That's a great question. And I think it's an especially pertinent question now, given the uncertainty of this current um, crisis we're in. Um, we, we, we really don't know what tomorrow's going to look like, let alone next week, next month, next year. You know, the media landscape is interesting because I'll, I'll give you a little, I'll, I'll try to be as transparent as possible. We are seeing huge viewership numbers right now. People are watching the news. They are consuming news online. They're reading articles. People are hungry for information. Um, the, the flip side of that is, and it, it, it I don't want to say it pains me, but it's, it's, I think as a journalist, we, we, we kind of fight for that journalism, the capital J, and we don't like to think of ourselves as being part of an industry. Um, but we do rely off of ad revenues and a lot of businesses right now are closed and they are laying off employees and they're not spending money on ad revenues. So we're kind of in this interesting ground where we are just telling impactful, powerful, wonderful, amazing stories. And then, you know, I, I read the other day about a newsroom in Chicago that was laying off reporters. And it just breaks my heart because this is the time that we need those stories to be told. This is when we need great journalists to be asking the tough questions, to be seeking truth, seeking answers, and doing that day in and day out. Um, but, you know, I think we're going to survive this. I think everything um, that we know and hold and value as journalists is going to survive this crisis as it has so many times before. Um, and I hope that it inspires our consumers, our viewers and readers and listeners um, to come back to us when this crisis is over, that we've developed that connection, um, that, that we now have fostered a relationship um, with, with our viewers so that they come back to us after this is all settled and we don't know when that's going to be, um, you know, but it, it's a really interesting time. And, and I do hope that for those who are just graduating, those who are just uh, leaving Pepperdine part of the class of 2020, that you keep your heads held high because yes, it's an uncertain time. You may not get a call back on that job that's, that's open or job that's not open. Um, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure this out, but I think it's, it's important to note, and I, I said this to some of the comm students a, a couple of weeks ago, is there's a reason why journalists are essential workers right now. There's a reason why I can still go into 30 Rockefeller Plaza and, and do my job, and, and that's okay under the, the governor's executive order, and that's because it is essential. We have free-flowing information from our media outlets, from our news organizations, to the people who are at home going through this crisis, doing their part to keep others safe and keep themselves safe. Um, but we need to get them that information and we need to hold power to account. We need to be in those news conferences with the governors, with the mayors, with the president, asking hard questions, trying to find truth where we can um, and, and realize that is our, it's not just a responsibility, it's a duty and a duty that we take very seriously. And so because you are protecting something uh, so, so precious and so grounded in the, the tenets of this whole idea of America, um, and something that's subject to change. Like, yes, a foundational truth, but the tactics of how, how we employ it are constantly changing. Um, how, how are you finding, finding the people who can help you with next steps and help you uh, know what's true and what's right and where to go and what's valuable? Uh, a constant question we have um, from both you know, like our current students or recent graduates or alumni is they're, they're looking for how do I find a mentor? How do I find business yeah. managers? How do I make those connections that will help me know, okay, here's where we go. Uh, you seem to do a great job of that. Um, do, you, do you have any hints or tips that you could give uh, your, your fellow colleagues and community here? Well, I mentioned some of my mentors when, when I was at Pepperdine and, and some of the people that, that certainly inspired me and encouraged me and were able to answer my questions along the way. And I, I think now that there's so many tools available that, that I, I, I didn't have in, in 2009 as, as long ago as that sounds. It really wasn't that long ago, but uh, we were joking earlier. That was when Facebook, you still had to have a uh, college email to sign up for it. Um, you know, I, I, I think if, if you find that alumni network at Pepperdine and you see someone who's doing what you want to do, they, they're, you know, they, they've reached certain goals that, that you have on your goal list. Um, reach out to them, send them a note. 
Um, and they might not get back to you right away. And, and I always feel bad. I just, I've, I've gotten notes before. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. It's taken me a while to get back to respond to you. But it, it encourages me as someone who has been in that position before to see that there are others that are reaching out and, and trying to find guidance and, and try to get answers to their questions. It, it's a very tricky landscape. Um, it, it always has been. I, I, I think trying to get your foot in the door requires a, a huge amount of persistence. It requires a huge amount of dedication towards furthering your knowledge, making mistakes, uh, but trying to trying to improve along the way, getting the reps in. Um, it's like going to the gym. You, you just got to get the reps in. You got to do the repetitions. It's grunt work. It's hard. You know, sometimes you get to rep number 10, number 11. You're like, oh, I'm tired. I just want to be done with this. Um, look, if you're in market 101 or market one here in New York, you're still putting in your reps. You're still trying to trying to do the work that that's required. So um, yeah, it's nice to have a little encouragement along the way. So you can reach out to me. I'm, I'm big on Instagram. That's kind of my uh, social media of choice. Um, it's just the easiest for me. And um, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, there, there are so many people within the Pepperdine network that you could easily reach out to. And it might not be as simple as, hey, do you have a job for me? Or, you know, who, who's hiring? I mean, there's certainly a level of, of groundwork that, that's required of you in that sense, too. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about those situations you may find yourself in. How do I navigate this? How do I figure this out? Because chances are I was in that very same position where you were. And uh, I, I graduated in 2009, which was during the, the recession. And, and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to find a job outside of college? Um, you know, I had friends that say, oh, well, I'm going to go to grad school or I'm going to do this and take a year off. And, and I was very fortunate that I was able to get a job right out of college. Um, actually started two weeks after, <laughs> after uh, the commencement ceremony. I was in West Palm Beach on my first day reporting there. So um, yeah, but it certainly takes a level of, of persistence and, and just um, sending your tapes out there, or your tapes, wow, that's dating myself, uh, sending your, your, your links to your reels, um, your YouTube reels or Vimeo reels, um, you know, sending those out there, just trying to, to network and find people that are willing to give you a shot. And I was very fortunate, um, you know, that, that Palestra kind of gave me a launching pad, Pepper and I gave me a launching pad, and there was a news director in West Palm Beach that was willing to give me a shot. That's excellent. And so you you are proof of putting in the work, charging into the fire, uh, being persistent with the connections. And as you've now said multiple times across the call, uh, you know, putting, doing the reps. Um, yeah. And that's, I, I love that metaphor. So can I add one more thing to that? that I, and, and it's one, something that I added earlier yeah. is just, I think being prayerful as well. And just remembering that God's timing part, you know, I, uh, as, as eager and as excited and as, as much as we want to get it done now, we want to go, go, go. Um, sometimes God puts us in a particular position, a particular place uh, that we need to learn something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I remember times when I was in Florida and I was like, and look, I, Florida was an, was an awesome news opportunity for me, but there were times like, I can't wait to get to a bigger market. I can't wait to get to a top 10 market, you know, be an anchor, do this, you know, tell these kinds of stories. And I completely neglected to be aware of my present circumstances and how much I was really soaking in and learning and really finding joy um, in, in a way that, not to say that I'm not finding that now or, or, you know, as you move up the ladder, but just being humbled and being appreciative of the circumstances you're in at that point. Um, I, I look back now, I'm like, wow, I had so much fun in West Palm. I made mistakes. Oh my gosh. I remember one time I covered a hurricane conference. It was probably my first week on the job. And again, Chicago, New York, California, hurricanes are, you know, maybe in New York a little bit, but hurricanes are really not part of the, 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 the normal sense of, of, it wasn't something I was used to talking about, um, the lexicon involved in it. It's called the cone of uncertainty. So this conference that I covered, my report after, I called it the cone of confusion on my live shot. And then I had a whole bunch of other things that I got wrong. After I finished my report, my news director calls me in the office and I'm thinking, oh boy, what did I mess up? And he, he had been in that conference that I had covered. 
And he told me exactly what I had gotten wrong. He's like, okay, buddy, it's not the cone of confusion. It's the cone of uncertainty. You got this forecast date wrong. You got this wrong. And I, I look back and I was so embarrassed, but I'm thankful that I made that mistake and I learned from it because now I'm never going to do that again. Um, and then, you know, it, it's, it's inspired me and encouraged me to do better each and every time. So yes, you will make mistakes. You will go through those challenges and those growing pains. Um, just learn from them. Mm. Embrace that moment that you're in there and, and be prayerful, you know, you move in the directions of your prayers and you'll eventually get to where you need to be. Mm. Great. So let's say you found yourself in a moment where good or bad, you know, the, the tank is empty. Mm. And you need to you need to refill and fill and you've been working hard, uh, learning your your regional dialect and all the appropriate language <laughs> terms. Um, how how do you refill the tank? What does that look like for you? Where do you turn? Um, and what are you learning from? That can both be historically and even right now. That is an awesome, awesome, awesome question. Um, for me, I find a lot of recharging of that energy uh, when I spend time with family. Uh, when I get those days off and I'm with my kids and they make me laugh and they make me realize how silly life can be. It's, it's easy to take life so seriously, but, but kids just have this mindset of play and of joy uh, and innocence. And, and just seeing that um, really brings joy to my life. So I, I find that's a way to recharge. It's also hectic and crazy, don't get me wrong. Um, but you know, the other thing is, um, I enjoy reading, um, especially books about aviation. I'm reading a really good book right now about Top Gun and the foundings of, uh, yeah, like the movie. Um, but this is actually about the, the real Top Gun, the real program that started, um, during the Vietnam war of how to train fighter pilots in the lost art of dog fighting. Um, so I, I love aviation books. I love flying, you know, it's, there's, there's a, a freedom when you're inside an airplane flying above the city, seeing all the cars and the people down below, and you're thinking, wow, I'm up here in the sky. This is pretty cool. Um, it's a lot of work as well. You know, some people would say, how can you relax when you're having to focus on all those controls and radios? And, you know, here in New York, we have the air traffic controllers barking at us. But um, there's, there's something freeing about that. And when, when I get into the airplane and I, I get back down on the ground, it's, um, I'm recharged, I'm ready to go. So it's important to take breaks. It's important to realize, you know, th those moments that energize you and those moments that drain you. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example today. You know, I was doing a ton of live shots. Um, I anchored the entire four o'clock news out on location, um, stay on my feet the whole time. Uh, I did a, several hits in the five and then the six and, you know, dealing with last minute changes and writing and being on camera, you're on the whole time. And, and literally I walked back to my car and I got in, it was like, this, whoa, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I've been on this whole time. So um, it's important to recognize that, have that self-awareness, that emotional awareness and realize when you need to recharge and, and get that fuel back in the tank. That's great. That's great. And I, I love that you said flying. I, I have to to pause on that. Some of my most cherished memories were I'm from Wichita, Kansas. The air capital. Absolutely. Capital. Yeah. So like, you're, you're speaking my language. Like your brother's um, a brother, pilot too, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah. Well done. Uh, um, uh, my brother Brendan Groves and Stephen uh, went went to Pepperdine together. He was a year ahead of you, two years. Uh, a year. Like maybe a year ahead of me. Uh, we were both in student government together. So uh, I, was, I think he know. graduated in '07. So you graduated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so two years um, ago. So, yeah, and uh, I remember bouncing down a little runway, uh, a little Craster runway, like, you know, a Cessna 152 or a little uh, Piper Comanche or something. Um, but yeah, there, there's something really great about that. And everybody has their, their Kokomo, so to speak. Yes. Um, their place, that Aruba, thing. Aruba, Jamaica. Ooh, I want to take, you know, that, that, that Kokomo, I got you. <laughs> you got it. Uh, <laughs> We, we all listen to it on the PCH. Come on. You, you <laughs> um, so everybody has that, but I do love that attention. So yes, you have a family. Yes, you have the striving career, but that hasn't been uh, something that inhibits you from, from having life. I think that those things are made better by you living the fullness of your life. Um, and, and so I'm so glad that you said that so that people can hear that. So they know that, man, that, that investment, I would, I would believe that, that you're saying and being a pilot, uh, that pays off 
in every other part of your life. And that's huge. And that's, that's part of you as a, as a whole person. It's synergistic. I mean, every, everything kind of relates to it. And as I mentioned before, you know, I love covering aviation stories. I'm actually trying to set up a story right now going behind the scenes at Newark Airport, um, talking about flying in the age of coronavirus. How are they keeping the planes clean? How are they going to handle check-in and passengers and all these new, the, the new normal of flying on an airplane again? Um, I, I don't know about you. It's been several, it's two months now since I've been on an airplane. So um yeah, you know, I, I, I love combining that part of it. Um, you know, the other thing with aviation, kind of like broadcasting, is, is it's humbling. You know, when, when you make a mistake in an airplane, it could be potentially um, deadly, potentially. So you have to have a lot of respect uh, for the craft, for the airplane, um, you know, for your, your role as a pilot. And um, so I, I, I've kind of seen, uh, I've seen a lot of parallels between aviation and and broadcasting. I think the number one thing is just keep calm under pressure. Just fly the airplane. You know, when we're having a bad day on, on the news and technology isn't working and, you know, my teleprompter goes out and it's just, just fly the airplane. Just be calm, be cool, talk to people, be real, and yep. we'll get through this. Stick to that voice. <laughs> Eric, no matter what's going on, yeah, engine's on fire. A little problem tower. It's fine. We're uh, going to bring her back around. Just you got that down. Happening. No matter what happens, the voice <laughs> is, stays the same. Uh, so, yes, these are exceptional times. We brought that up, but this isn't the first time we've all encountered challenge. It won't be the last. Uh, we have people in all different stages of their career, of their lives. Um, some might be at, at the pit. Some might be, uh, um, you know, the moment of uncertainty, not knowing what's next. Uh, what we can all agree on is that there's a lot of change. So if, if you are going to have a message to the Pepperdine community as a whole for how we work together, how we talk together, um, how we make a way forward right now, what would you say? Wow. Um, all you know, on your shoulders. Yeah. No, no I, I'm going through the same thing. I mean, th there's so much uncertainty right now. As I say, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what next week, next month is going to bring. Look, I, I, I've tried to find the moments during this crisis and recognize, okay, we're here for a reason. We're, we're here for a purpose. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we're doing what we need to do during this time. So I think trying to find that sense of just being and not always planning and, and not always looking towards the future. And I, I think there is an element that we still need to do that. We still need to be mindful of what's coming down, down the road um, in the sense of our careers in the sense of, of life. Uh, you know, we were talking about, we can't wait till we can start doing nursery school again with the kids and, and get a little break at home or, you know, when, when I can go flying again and, and do a lot of these other things. Um, but you know what? I, I think there's so much in the present right now that we can embrace and find joy in. Um, you know, just today I, I went for a walk with my kids and birds were chirping, the sun was shining. And I was thinking, nah, if this was a normal day, you know, I'd be running around with my hair on fire trying to figure out what, what I need to do for the work day ahead. And um, so certainly um, I, I've, I've tried to develop more and more skills and it is a work in progress of embrace those moments of beauty and, and grace and being in the moment. Uh, while still balancing this crazy um, career that I have and, and trying to be really mindful of its importance and mindful of, of what we need to be doing, the questions we need to be asking and being aggressive in that sense of asking those questions. Um, this might seem a little bit like a paradox, but I, I think it can be done in the sense that we find that we, we strive to find that balance. It's not going to be perfectly in balance, but uh, try to find as we drift almost like a sailboat uh, attacking and jiving, try to get to where we need to be um, so that we are really embracing this gift that we have today and being looking and looking forward towards the future and, and making those plans and doing what we need to do to achieve those plans. Yeah, I love that. I think you're right. I, I think this is a gift. Um, just as hard as everything might be in some respects, we also have opportunities like we've never had before and we, we might not ever have again um, in this life. And like, we've certainly never had opportunities to connect. And like you said, uh, and uh, last week we had uh, Sylvia Franson on, um, who's a VP at NBC University. Yeah. And I love what she said about, hey, everybody's on their computer. Send them a message. We're all looking to connect. We're all hungry for it. Uh, uh, Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, who's in your part of the world, 
um, wonderful uh, neuroscientist uh, just posted a study where they found that if you go a day without real human connection, there's a part of your brain that triggers that's just like hunger. It's a similar response. Interesting. I, I, I love that. But that, that's, that hunger, this challenge, yeah. is the same time a prompt uh, to dig a little bit deeper and find a little bit greater value. Yeah. Um, and when everybody else might, might go the other way and might you know, set sail in a direction, like what could happen if we stuck together? Yeah. Um, I, I love that idea. And I, I think that's great. Uh, so we only have two minutes and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. This, this has flown by. I haven't, I haven't stopped smiling this entire hour. That's fantastic. This is awesome. Uh, no, thanks again for inviting me. This is fun. So, so as a last thing with you in New York, especially given New York's special connection to this, this current, um, crisis, everything that's going on, how, how can we as a community pray for you? You know, I, I think pray for... I, I, I think we need to be praying for as many people as we can right now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and not even just for, um, I, th I think, finding a solution to this virus, finding a solution to all, all the problems that we're dealing with now. But I just, I just pray that people in this moment of uncertainty find God. I, I just think there's so many opportunities for that. Um, you know, I, I think there's really a chance to have that connection and to, to use this opportunity. And it, you know, it's not to say that it didn't exist before, but now it's, we're home, we're with our families, or we're not with our families. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of in the midst of this thing. If there's a chance for us to develop that relation and create that transforming relationship with God, then I think this is an awesome opportunity for that. Um, so I, I pray for, for folks in that sense. And I think that I also pray for, you know, here in New York, I, I just think the fear factor is still. I think it's still a big deal. Um, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I was up in Connecticut and the people were like, I don't need a mask. I don't need to be following these protocols. This is not a big deal. Um, there are a lot of people who are very scared right now. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are, are scared about the future for their health. They're scared about the future for their jobs and for the economy. Um, if we could try to reduce that fear, I don't want to say eliminate it, um, but I think if we could reduce that fear and really focus on the things that, ooh, Oh, I'm sorry, my alarm going off. Um, focus on the things that um, are going to make us better as as a society, make us better as Christians, make us better people. Um, I think that that's an awesome opportunity. So I, I pray for that. Love it, incredible. I, I can't think of anything better. Uh, so I, I don't I don't want to put anything else on top of that other than to say thank you so much for leading us well, for sharing with us. Thank you for your heart. Um, and for your diligence and the application of what you believe to your life. Um, we, we love you. We appreciate you. Um, oh, thank you. And hey, this, this, we're all here for each other. We're all here for you. Uh, I hope everybody in this call, we all share that. We all share this community, this heritage, um, and, and this choice to, to do something with the moment. So y your story is, is remarkable and it's still unfolding. And we're all so stoked uh, to see what happens. Next. Stoked. That's, that's stoked. I'm from Kansas, but I'm, I'm trying. Um, you your out. West Coast through and through now. That's, yeah, uh, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, another Kansas farm boy finding his way to Malibu and thinking, right. I'm not going to stay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yes. So, again, this whole conversation, the Seaver Speaker Series, we're here to, to share these stories, to connect, and to work together on what's next. Um, as you said, uh, let's all be reaching out to each other. Um, let's be praying for each other. Um, and let's be working together. That's our whole call is to work together yeah. on, on what's next and opening those doors for each other. So thank you so much for waving at people in the guardhouse. Um, <laughs> I miss those days. Yeah. Yeah. And, and taking those lessons you learned in political science and, and applying it, man, we love you. We're proud of you. Um, and that is it. You know, day. we didn't get time for the questions there. So if anybody wants to reach out to me with a question, send it on, on Instagram. It's Steph Holt 4NY on Instagram. Send me a question on there. Um, I'll just give you my, this is probably going up on the web, but um, I'll give you my email as well. It's Stefan, S-T-E-F-A-N dot Holt, H-O-L-T at N-B-C-U-N-I dot com, like NBC Universal. And um, yeah, just connect with me. If, if, if you were inspired by something we talked about here or you have another question, let me know. All right. <laughs>
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Stefan, for being available. Everybody, thank you for joining the call. And we will see you uh, tomorrow, actually. We have, we have a special edition, uh, edition um, uh, at 5 p.m. on, uh, that's May 21st. It's a third Thursday brought to you by Alumni Relations. We're going to have uh, Christina Schneider uh, talking about the importance of self-care, which, again, has been a constant theme. Um, so if you're interested in finding out uh, what, what your flying is, what that moment is for you, please join us tomorrow. Um, you can find out more about that on the Pepperdine website. Uh, if you search see your speaker series, and if you search for our third Thursday programs, that will come up. But thank you so much. Um, I'm sure Chad will put a link in there, and we're glad that you were on the call. Um, freely received, freely give, folks. Let's go do it. Cheers. Rob.